What if I told you that when I started out, I only had one spaceship and seven cubes in my bank account? Now, I've got five ships and I make 10 to 14 cubes every round. I'm talking white cubes, green cubes, those big blue cubes. I even get an octagon every once in a while. And what if I told you that you can too? All it takes is you giving me one black cube right now and every round for the rest of the game. And all of this can be yours today. I don't know, this doesn't sound like a good deal for me. It's a great deal. And what if I told you that by seizing this opportunity, you could become one of my platinum elite trading partners? Yeah, but it looks like you need black cubes to score points. Don't worry about that. Just buy my cubes. Please, please just buy my cubes. Hey, I'll give you what you need for just like a couple green cubes. Oh, uh, yeah, that sounds good. Wait, wait, no, 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 no. Uh, what if I told you that I'm desperate? Hey folks, my name is Shay Parker and this is RTFM, the show where I teach you how to play a game. Because board games are the only place where the average person experiencing unfettered capitalism is fun, actually. And today we're learning how to play Sidereal Confluence, a game where four to nine players will be acting as a bunch of inscrutable aliens trying to turn a profit through negotiation, trade, and what is basically space alchemy. This game will reward those with keen economic minds, silver tongues, or the ability to understand just what any of the other players are even doing. But whether or not you have any of that, I guarantee you're going to have a memorable time. So let's learn how to play Sidereal Confluence. Okay, so before we get started, a couple quick but important things. First off, I am but a fallible human man and have made a mistake or two in my life. If that happens and I get a minor rules detail wrong, I'll be posting corrections in the Klingon subtitles. So please turn those on or check the description box below. Second, my Patreon backers choose what I teach, so if you really want me to cover a specific game, becoming a rules lawyer is the best way to make that happen. Rules lawyers will also get early access to a second sidereal video where I'll be teaching how each faction's rules and special abilities work. Okay, enough of all that, let's jump in. In sidereal Confluence, you'll play as one of nine alien factions, each more bizarre than the last, who are joining together to forge a peaceful new society. Of course, doing so while being almost incompatibly different means that someone's going to come out on top. You'll play six rounds, with each round consisting of three phases, where all players take their actions simultaneously. The phases are trade, where you'll make promises and deals and exchange just about anything, economy, where you'll put the resources you've earned into converters to make more resources, and confluence, where you'll share technologies and bid on planets and new tech. At the end of the sixth round, each player will reveal their points, and whoever has the most will win. But before we get to that, let's set some things up. Start by having each player choose a faction. Fortunately, there are pronunciation guides on almost all of them. No idea how I'm supposed to say Z, but whatever. You can sign them randomly, but because they're so different, I'd recommend using this page in the rulebook to give players an idea of what each faction is like and letting them choose. And unless you majored in economics, I strongly recommend avoiding the most complex factions on your first game. Let's say we go with the Kits or Crit Riddle, aka the Kit. Every faction's player board details their specific weirdness, and they'll also come with a card that tells you what you start with. Going from the bottom up, we get a handful of resources, a random level 1 research team, a random colony card, and our starting converters, which all have stars in the corners. For us, they come in pairs, but that's just one of the unique things about the kit. Each faction has unique rules, so make sure everyone reads their player board carefully in case there are any specific set of variations. Once everyone has chosen a faction, grab the colony and research team boards that match your player count and fill them with cards. Let's say we have just four players, so we'd take these two boards. The research deck has different levels of cards and should be stacked in such a way that the level 4 cards are on the bottom, then the level 3s, and so on. Draw out cards with the research team side up, going from left to right. The colonies are placed with their basic side face up, but otherwise are shuffled and random. You'll also make a confluence stack of round tracker cards matching your player count, and splay them like so. Once you've done this and placed all the resources around the table, you'll be ready to start playing. So let's dive in. So earlier I did say that there were three phases, trade, economy, and confluence, and they happen in that order, but I want to cover economy as well as some basic concepts before getting into trade. Let's start with converters. These are the backbone of each player's economic engine, and they're one of the main ways you'll increase your wealth. You start with a few, and everyone has plenty more that you'll acquire throughout the game. While the starting converters are wildly different between factions, the rest of them are fairly similar. They'll have the same name and basic function, but they'll often make slightly different resources. Speaking of, the resources in the game are small cubes, big cubes, octagons, ships, and victory points. Yes, they mostly have different names than those, but besides the octagons being called Ultra Tech, I can never remember what they are. Anyway, victory points are kept secret behind your little shield, but everything else is open information. And the resources are unlimited, so if you run out, you can use these tokens to indicate fives. 
you'll also have a reference card that estimates the value of each resource. So as you can see, an ultra attack is worth about one point, whereas a small cube is only about a third of a point. Okay, so back to those converters. These do just what you think. They convert stuff into other stuff and always add a net positive. The numbers on the middle top show the estimated value of the conversion. This considers a small cube to be worth one and extrapolates from there. There's a fair bit more info on these cards, but for now, just look at what's in the center. Anything with an arrow like this can yield some kind of result. So converters will do it, colonies will too, and there are plenty of other cards as well. For now, we're only gonna look at the cards with white arrows because these are straightforward and they only trigger during the economy phase, which is three steps. Check colony support, run white converters, and place donations. Colonies are cards that have a simple ongoing conversion, and you'll probably want to get your hands on a few of them, but each faction can only handle so many, and just how many will be listed on your faction board. It's possible to have more than this number, but once the economy phase rolls around, the first thing you do is check them against your colony support. If you have too many planets, remove cards from your tableau until you hit your maximum, discarding any excess to the bottom of the deck. Once you've done that, it's time to run your converters, and this is as simple as filling your inputs and seeing what comes out. You don't have to run every card, in fact, you'll probably never be able to, so choose which cards you want to run, place matching resources in their input, gain whatever is listed in the output, and give the input resources back to the general supply. Now a few things to keep in mind. All of these conversions are run simultaneously, so you can't use the output from one card to pay the input of another. Also, some cards don't have anything listed in their input, and these are just getting you free stuff each turn. And lastly, some cards will show outputs with purple outlines. These are donations, and any donation outputs must be placed on your donation card. Unlike the other outputs, which will add to your personal supply, donations can't be used by you. Instead, they must be traded away. However, there's a big rule during the economy phase that you cannot trade or make any deals with anyone. During this phase, you mind your own business. But since trading is such a big part of the game, let's talk about that next. Okay, so this is the most free form of all the phases, and even though it's just called trade, you can do a bit more than that. In fact, there are four things you can do. You can trade and make deals, that's one, but you can also run converters with purple arrows, you can upgrade cards, and you can invent technologies. You do these as much as you want in any order until everyone's had their fill. Let's go through them one by one. Trading is pretty simple. You use your language skills to convince another player to give you something in exchange for something else. This is the only time in the game where you can exchange your goods, and here's the thing, you can trade almost anything. Your cubes, your ships, your ultra tech, trade them all. You can even give your cards away, but the one thing you can't trade is your points. Those stay hidden until the end of the game. Now there are exceptions to all this, but I'll get to them in a bit. You can also take part in multilateral trades, meaning that the exchange involves more than two people all at once. So player one gives something to player two, who gives something to player three, who gives something to player one. And then presumably, everyone's happy. And if you don't have enough to offer now, you can make deals, promising to give or do something in the future. And those deals are binding. If it's possible to do what you promised, you have to do it. If it's not possible, you can renegotiate the deal, but the offended party gets to approve or not. And if they don't, you gotta give compensation. Pay as much of what you owe as you can, and then lose a point for each cube or ship you owe, and two points for each ultra tech, card, or point you owe. This can push you into the negative, but since there aren't any negative point chips, just keep track of that, I guess. Or don't let it happen in the first place, that's good too. Anyway, now that we've talked about the basics, here are some of those exceptions I mentioned. Normally, when you trade something away, it's gone for good. However, if you trade a card that has your faction's name on the sides, that will be returned to you at the end of the round. Other cards won't do this, so keep that in mind when giving away research teams or colonies. The second exception involves something we mentioned earlier, donations. If you made a donation resource, it will go on your donation card. You can't use these resources for yourself, you can only give or trade them away, but you'll usually be able to find some takers. However, if you don't, you'll have to give them to another player or players of your choice at the end of the trade phase. The exception comes in because sometimes you'll make donation points, and even though you normally can't trade points, if they're on your donation card, then it's okay. Alright, so that's all for the actual trading part of the trade phase. Let's get to those purple arrows. These are attached to some faction-specific cards, some upgrades, and all research teams. Unlike white converters, these can be done one at a time, and they're usually all about getting you new or improved cards and or points. Let's take this level 1 research team for example. These pharmaceutical scientists are working on a nice, achievable goal. Clinical immortality. To do this, they'll need either six green cubes or two ultra tech. You provide the input, then gain one point, and you can ignore this sharing bonus for now, I'll get to it later. Anyway, after that's finished, you flip the research team over and find the clinical immortality converter in your deck of cards. Everyone has this card, and it will always involve turning two blue cubes into a point and a small cube. 
The reason the small cube is purple here is because that particular output is different among the various factions. So now you have clinical immortality and you can use it during the economy phase. Huzzah! But maybe instead you have something else in mind. Converters are good to have, but since you'll end up getting more of them than you'll know what to do with, another use for these cards is to fuel upgrades. Looking at this genetic engineering card, we see the names of two converters on the bottom, one of them being clinical immortality. Either of these cards can be placed beneath genetic engineering, effectively removing them from our tableau in order to upgrade the top card, flipping it over to show the new and improved genetic resynthesis. And this name change isn't just for flavor. Any other card that requires genetic engineering to upgrade will not accept this resynthesis card. Now, that's one way to upgrade a card, but some cards will allow you to pay a different cost instead. The NEET starting converter Coral Song, for example, can be upgraded by spending clinical immortality, but you could also use this conversion that requires you to spend two blue cubes and a water colony. It'll earn you a point, and because of where it's placed on the card, you know it will also upgrade this into some eternal music. Lovely. And since we mentioned colonies, they can also be upgraded, usually just for a single cube, and this will upgrade their output and change their terrain, which, as you just saw, will occasionally be important, but can often be ignored. And lastly, some factions will have cards or tiles that require you to run a converter before playing them, with their cost shown at the top or on the back of the card. However, since those and a few other symbols that will come up are all faction specific, I'll be covering them in my factions video instead. For now, let's move on to the confluence phase. Unlike the freewheeling jazz that is the trade phase, the confluence is much more structured. You're going to do a few things in order, and then you'll start a new round. First up, anyone who invented a technology during the trade phase has to share it. Everyone else looks through their tech deck and pulls out the matching converter. Meanwhile, if you share technology, look at the current round card to see what the sharing bonus is and earn that many points. The only exception to all this is level 4 technologies, which only ever get you points anyway. You still get the sharing bonus too, just without actually sharing anything. The earlier you share tech, the more you get, but spending those resources early on can hamper your growth considerably, so don't feel like you have to rush into it. Once that's done, it's time to look at the bidding track. There's a row of random colonies and a row of research teams that will increase in cost and value as you go through them. We've mentioned ships a few times, and this is where they come in handy. Ships are kind of like money, and you'll be using them to bid on these cards. Start by everyone announcing how many ships they have, then hiding them, and crucially, you're going to choose your bid amounts for both colonies and research teams at the same time. Place one bid in one hand and the other in the other. Also, make sure you decide ahead of time which hand is which. Once everyone has chosen their bids, reveal for the colonies. Whoever has bid the most will get first pick. If you see something you like, pay all of the ships you bid and take one card. However, the minimum cost is shown above the card, so if you bid less than this number, you can't take it. If you can't or don't want to buy a card, you can pass and just keep your ships instead. Once that's done, you'll bid on research teams in exactly the same way. If there's a tie during a bid, first look at how many colonies or research teams each tied player has, matching the thing you're bidding on. If one player has the fewest, they'll buy first, and so on. If you're still tied, check the tiebreaker value on your faction board and go from highest to lowest. Now during the confluence phase, you are allowed to make deals, say to stop someone from taking a planet you really want, and while those deals are binding, you still can't exchange any physical components until the next trade phase. After bidding, if there are any remaining cards with a minimum bid of one, discard them to the bottom of the respective decks, slide the rest down, and refill the rows. Then flip over the current round card and move on to the next trade phase. The face down side of the card tells you how many of each phase are left in the game, so let's fast forward and talk about the last round, which works a little differently. As you can see, there's this scoring only economy phase. At the end of the last economy phase, you won't really need your resources anymore, so you can convert them directly into points using this conversion table here. And for the last round only, you get to keep, and thus convert to points, any donations you create. Scores are tracked to the half point, or if you want to get really granular, you can count each individual resource by twelfths, but I don't recommend that unless you need to break a tie. After you've converted your points, you won't have another confluence phase, except to earn the sharing bonus on any last round techs you made. Once that's done, count up your VPs and see who won. There's no official tiebreaker, so like I said, you can use any remaining bits and bobs to figure it out, or just call it a draw if you have the same score. I honestly doubt it'll happen that often, but there you go. Anyway, that's all you need to know to start playing Sidereal Confluence. I hope it helps you get to the table, and as I mentioned before, my Patreon backers will get early access to the faction-specific rules video, but it'll also go live for everyone else in about a month. My rules lawyers have also voted on what I'm going to teach next, and it looks like it'll be a feast for Odin. Looking forward to it. If you want to suggest and vote on what games I teach, head on over to the Patreon and become a rules lawyer. If not, that's fine too. Either way, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.
ไป